Part 4. How the flesh dances and how the flesh plays. How the flesh toils and spins through its days. See the flesh happy and strapping and young. See the flesh sagging and dragging and glum. Hear now the giggling. See shadows grow. Step down the hallway. Each door aglow. Watch now the ceiling. Sweet cradle rocks. Who made these puppets? Who made this clock? Ancient hand on the cradle. Withered lips form a song. Golden wheels spinning backward. Withered hand becomes young. The hands can spin. Spin then slow. The clock is wound afresh. But is the key. Turn this time. By fingers made of flesh. I set Karen up in the electroconvulsive tub and wiped the warm gel from her face and detached the breathing tube. Her head rolled back her face glistening in the glare of the lead. I could see the shape of the skull clearly through the wet skin. Slowly, she pulled her head upright, blinking the goo from her eyelashes. Hat. Hi. Hello. Hello. Can you hear this? Yeah, I can hear you, I said. Wow. Okay. It worked. Good, she said. Her voice was completely flat and surprisingly deep for somebody so scrawny. I am here, she said, baring her teeth in what might have been a smile. Can you see anything? I asked. She opened her eyes wider and moved them around. Yes. Persistent shapes, she said, pronouncing the word persistent like a child. Can you see how many fingers I'm holding up? No. Try squinting. Oh, right. That changes things. Hmm. Two. She was right, except she was looking at a completely different direction than my hand. Great, I said. Slowly, her knobby knees emerged from the gel, and she grasped them with her hands. It was a good sign for somebody in her state. It also showed that she knew some of the standard tests for emergence. We went through a few more of the tests and found that the treatment had worked well. She might even be walking soon. I got her out of the tub and washed her off and put her into some scrubs. She managed to sit upright on the table without leaning on anything, her bony arms set stiffly at her sides. Can I ask you a question? I asked. Sure, she said in her deep, childish monotone. What is Q? You want the whole story. Yet. She took a deep breath. Okay. So, approximately 50,000 years ago. She told me the whole story of Q as she knew it, from the beginning in prehistory, when the hyperspace code was inserted into the human genome, and she went all the way to right now and the so-called plague of the flesh. Her description of the plague explained what happened to poor Zhen Zhen in her hygiene bed. It also explained the red butterfly thing I found the other hygiene bed. If you are listening to this, I guess you have access to her story as well. Hopefully she wrote down the whole history of Q because I honestly didn't understand it all and couldn't do it justice. If I had heard it on any other day than the day Atlanta was destroyed, I wouldn't have believed any of it. As it was, I just took it all in in a calm detached way, as if I was just listening to another delusional. I guess you'll be reading her story before any of this even happens, so you'll be inclined to believe it even less. So, at that point, I asked her how she knew so much about Q, like what its plans were and everything. She said Q had recently stopped hiding anything from her and the other bred soldiers. It was fully confident in its ability to win against them in any scenario. It no longer felt the need for any secrecy. I asked her why it had tried to kill her and she said that it hadn't. It was planning to destroy Atlanta anyways. She had arranged for the assassin herself, an improvisation to get her out of the city more quickly. I asked her if her ability to see all those extra dimensions allowed her to see into the future. 
she told me that she could only see extra dimensions in the feed realm. It allowed her fight against Q more effectively because she can process information on a different level. She explained, when you look at a digital picture, you can process a huge matrix of color values all at once. If you tried to process the same picture by looking at a list of color codes for each point, like R101, G254, B017, it would take forever and be incomprehensible. For certain problems, I have the same advantage over you that you have over a guy reading a list of color codes on a ticker. I can see many things all at once. But I can only see extra dimensions in the feed realm. Here outside the realm, there seems to be only three dimensions plus one timeline. I can't see beyond that. But I can imagine beyond it. So you can't see the future. No I can only imagine the future. I can imagine a lot of futures. Then why did you hire an assassin for yourself? I mean, that just seems like a really risky move. Like, something that was unlikely to pan out. Oh? I couldn't imagine many scenarios where it wouldn't have worked. Really? What if I had just been like, fuck this, I'm out of here. Oh, come now. Nobody would do that. Nobody would do that? Almost everybody would do that. He had a gun. Wrestling over firearms is quite common. Maybe in feed narratives, but not in real life. You see stories about that kind of thing all the time in the news. We argued about this point for quite a while. It was like arguing with an intelligent child who has no clue about the real world. Her view of real life had been warped by seeing only the sensational parts of it that managed to leak into the feed realm. She seemed completely unaware of that most basic and fundamental fact of human life, that most of it is boring, that most of it is just waiting around, that people go through large portions of their lives tired and sleepy and wanting to lie down. I tried to convince her of this, but in her short time in the real world, she had experienced a murder, a drone strike and nuclear holocaust, so I wasn't having much success until lo and behold she got tired and wanted to lie down. I helped her onto a gurney, and we made plans to head toward Plattsburgh in upstate New York. She said that the key to defeating Q was somewhere near there. Of course, she was lying to me, but I didn't realize it at the time. When we got to the Clearview Hospital, it was like Karen said it would be. The emergency room was flooded with patients coming in from Atlanta, but the readjustment center was empty except for a lone staffer who was watching the lobby's wall set and praying. The set was showing footage of the black cloud over Atlanta. Or maybe it was Denver. Or Riyadh. Twelve cities had gone up in the last hour. They weren't the largest or most powerful cities in the world. Hefei. Zhengzhou. Bengaluru. What was the pattern? What the hell had Bengaluru done to anybody? Karen said there was no real pattern. This is Q's opening move. Her entrance into the world. She won't destroy everything. But she will kill and kill until she thinks we are ready for her demands. I found a wheelchair by the readjustment center's entrance and wheeled Karen down to the EMRT room. Somewhere, a hygiene bed's life alarm was ringing. I ignored it. My goal was to get Karen some muscle treatment. A single treatment probably wouldn't give her enough strength to stand on her own, but she could at least hold her head up and move her arms, and she might regain her voice and sight. In the treatment room, I filled a treatment tub with the minty-smelling conducting gel and washed Karen off and fit her with breathing tube. These were normally tech duties, stuff I thought I would never be doing again. Looking down at this little twig of a woman on the table, it occurred to me that all I had to do was tie off her breathing tube, and that would be the end of her. I asked her the question that kept coming to my mind. How do I know for sure that you didn't blow up Atlanta yourself? How do I know you aren't full of shit? My set was blank for a while before she answered. Well, how could I prove it? I tried to think of a way. Some kind of test. I don't know, I said finally. You know much about statistical proxy distillation tracing? No. Then it would be hard to prove it to you. So how do I know it wasn't you? 
You can't know. I need to know if I'm going to help you. Then learn about statistical proxy distillation tracing. I don't have time to learn about fucking statistical proxy distillation tracing. Then you can't know. Or just dealing with stuff that's too advanced. I walked away from the table and sat down in a nearby chair. I felt like I was cracking up. The urge to cry had come and passed every few minutes, and it came again. I don't know what to do. I told you we must get to upstate New York. There's a way to defeat Q. Maybe you are Q. Listen before you put me in the gel, I want you to pull my jack battery. Cut it off. And that would prove you're not Q. Not really. I could have scripted everything. Oh. But it would mean I can't directly order nuclear strikes. Oh, well, that's a relief. I said, rubbing my face and trying to blink away the fresh wave of tears. What's in upstate New York that's so important? There is a resource Q can't access. Something she cannot defend against. What? Honestly, if you don't understand something simple like statistical proxy distillation tracing, you won't understand this. Fucking great, I said. We sat there in silence for a long moment. Finally, Another message showed up. I'm not Q. I spent my life fighting Q. I fought Q instead of living a life. We still have a chance to win. We must win. I sighed and stood up and walked over to her. Well, then let's get started. Good. I found the jack patch on the back of Karen's neck and squeezed at the tattooed points. Her battery capsule slowly slid out of her skin like a giant blackhead. I disconnected the wire. Now she was completely disconnected from infraspace. I picked up her body and gently lowered it into the conducting gel. It took a minute for her to sink to the bottom, for the gel slowly slide over her face like a closing curtain. I dialed up 90 minutes of muscle treatment and 30 minutes of eye treatment and started the tub up. I sat for a while, listening to the soft wobbling sounds of the gel shifting as Karen's muscles clenched and unclenched at a rapid-fire rate. This was the sort of spare moment where a person would stare at their set and look at game replays or something, but my set was a just a long list of red interrupts, telling me about how everybody was dead. I realized that the hygiene bed's life alarm was still going off in some other room. Usually when I heard that sound, I went racing to find out what was going on but I had just ignored it. Well, the person was probably dead before we got here. What were the odds that they had just gone into arrest when we walked in the door? And who gave a shit anyways when a 100 million people had also died today? Still, there was an instinctive part of me that wanted to run toward the sound that wanted to help. I got up and walked down the hall. The ringing got louder. At the end of the hallway, there was a small room with four hygiene beds that had been brought in for in-hospital disconnection, a procedure usually reserved for really complex cases. The last bed was blinking red. I took a look at the readout, but it didn't show cardiac arrest. In fact, it was showing 260 BPM. It must have been malfunctioning. I looked at the patient chart. Zhen Zhen Sobakin. 24 years old. Total connection duration, 47 minutes. It must have been runtime crash. Unlucky. I pressed the seal button, and the bed lid opened up. When she came into view, I staggered back and shouted for help. Okay. Now I'm in my bedroom. The bedroom smells like, bedroom. Actual bedroom. Oh, so definite. It's a smell like wood and blankets and stuff. Sharp. I wonder how they decide on the bedroom smell. I move my arms around and bounce a little on the bed springs. My body feels really natural and comfortable. Everything looks sharp too. There are no weird color trails like an acclimation. Cool. Really crisp. I stand up and take in all the little touches. It's an attic bedroom with a slanting ceiling and wood panel walls. Night outside the window. Mood lighting from a nightstand lamp. Clothes and a skateboard and other random teenage stuff scattered on the floor. Walls covered with posters. 
INXS. The Cure. Michael Jackson in a yellow vest. Very definite. Or should I say groovy? Did they say that in the 80s? An interrupt comes through. Atlanta completely destroyed in full scale I use my illegal bypass to cut off all interrupts. Ugh. I hate sports interrupts. I'll have to figure out how to change that setting. I notice a can of Pepsi free sitting on my nightstand. I pick it up. Still cold. I crack it open and smell it, and the fizz tickles my nose. It really smells like soda. I take a sip. Wow. Hmm. Not very good. Maybe it's a low quality render. Or maybe I just don't like Pepsi free. Still, it's pretty amazing to be tasting something in a feed. This was really worth it. The doorbell rings somewhere downstairs. Oh, definitely. We're starting. I head towards the door and catch myself in the mirror. I'm supposed to look like a girl named Brooke Shields at 18 years old. Wow, she's pretty. What a render. The eyebrows are a little intense though. I consider toning them down, but I don't want to get caught up in character design. If you change one thing, you end up changing 50 things, and it goes on forever. I head out into the hallway and pause for a moment. The smell just changed. Now there's a hallway smell. Carpet and drywall. I laugh. I take a step back into the bedroom, and the bedroom smell returns instantly. I step into the hallway again. Hallway smell. Bedroom smell. Hallway smell. Bedroom smell. I snicker at this. The smell changes just like that. Why they can't make it more natural? What a giveaway. Oh, well. I head down the stairs. The furniture in the front hall looks really cheesy. I pick up a lamp and toss it at the wall. It smashes apart, and the bulb explodes with a spark. I look at the shards. There's bits of powder and all sorts of little details. Yo. Very certain. Undo that, I say, and the lamp fades away and reappears on the side table. I open the front door. A guy stands there with swept back blonde hair and a baggy red and black jacket with the collar popped and the sleeves rolled up. Nice. He gives me a killer smile and says, Hey babe. What took you so long? A blast of electric guitar hits me, and the guy floats up out over the front lawn, becoming two stories tall and striking a sexy pose. Colors fill the night sky. Sparkling starlight showers him, and synth beat kicks in. An announcer shouts, Corey Lancer. High school hotshot and rock and roll renegade. He's a fast talker with a slick attitude, a guy who can make anything happen. All the girls want him, but all he wants is one thing, the Ferrari 288 GTO. A red sports car comes flying out of the sky and does crazy circles around Corey while he strikes more sexy poses and the music thumps. It's the fastest street legal car in existence. Only 272 produced. This is Corey's dream, Corey's obsession, Corey's life. He'll do anything to get one, and he needs your help. Can you get the car? Can you win his heart? Are you ready for 80s turbo ascension? Hmm shit. I should have looked the summary closer. I'm not really into cars, and this doesn't really seem like a very interesting narrative. Still. Corey is really well rendered. Blonde hair, blue eyes. A bit of mischief in his smile. I like it. I wonder if he'll be controlled by an AI or a Filipino. He floats back down to me and returns to normal size. So what's up, he said, with a devilish little grin. Wow, this is a stuff. Just doing my hair, I say, flicking my huge brown mane off my shoulder. This Brooke Shields lady has an absurd amount of hair. You chicks, Corey says, leaning forward and giving me a kiss. His mouth tastes like bubble gum. The kiss feels perfect. Yo. Just definitely. I feel Corey's chest through his shirt. Skinny, but nice. I think about toning him up a bit. Nat, 
it's better to just go with his default settings. So, listen, there's a race tonight at the Speed Max track, Corey says in his cute California accent. The Crystal Cobras put out a challenge and they're taking all comers. The prize is... I don't really like racing. Corey thinks for a moment, a character animation. He looks cute thinking, his sharp eyebrows pressed together. Now he's taking too long, and it's getting awkward. I think he's controlled by a Filipino. Or maybe there's lag. He snaps back into action. Okay, listen. There's going to be a dance-off at the club heatwave. The Crystal Cobras put out a challenge, and they're taking all comers. The prize is $100,000. Dancing? Yeah, that would be one way to try out my body. Sounds groovy, I say. But I can't help but think of another way to give this body a test drive. I slip my hand down into my tight purple skirt and feel my pussy. Oh, yeeks. They really have everything working down there. Should I do it already? Just five minutes into the narrative? Oh, why not? Everybody does it right away. Corey looks really good. I wonder what kind of cock they rendered him with. But no, I should at least go half an hour without slutting it up. Dancing will be fun. Corey holds out his arm like a gentleman, and I take it. He leads me down the front walk towards his car, a smeary old junk ride with dents and rust all over it. Sorry, Han it's only temporary, Corey says as we come up on the car. I promise you, by the end of this week, I'm going to have a Ferrari 288 GTO, the fastest street legal car in the world. It's my dream. It's my obsession. I'll do anything to. But I'm not listening. There is something in the bushes by the road. I wonder if this is actually one of those fake-out horror narratives. I really hate scary stuff. I bend over and look into the bushes. A pair of shining eyes are we watching real choices in action, or are the events of this universe occurring along some deterministic path? Is there any way to find out? Maybe some sort of test should be devised. But that would require the author to play along. Are back at me. You. What the hell? There's an old naked lady hiding in the bushes. Stay paranoid my friends.